morning. It is great to be with you. We have three distinguished guests this morning. Immediate to my left right here, a man who needs no introduction to this audience, an American hero, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator John McCain. And next to Senator John McCain, a man who was inside Israel's military establishment for 40 years. His most recent position was head of military intelligence for the IDF. He's participated in two non-proliferation uh, operations on behalf of Israel, the first of which was as a pilot. As a young pilot in 1981, he was one of the pilots in the Israeli operation into Osirak in Iraq. Please help me welcome General Amos Yadlin. and a distinguished member of the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee, a newer member to the Senate, but has played a key role in helping to combat anti-Israel sentiment at the United Nations in a number of roles through the Senate. Please help me welcome Senator Kirsten Gillibrand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I want to I want to jump right into the discussion. We have a short period of time and a lot of uh, territory to cover. Senator McCain, I want to start with you. Iran is on everybody's mind. Uh, you have been working and thinking about the issue of Iran for a very long time, long before it was on many people's radar screen. In short, what can the United States and Israel do working together to deal with Iran and prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapons capability? Uh, thank you, Dan, and thank you all for the very warm welcome. And may I say what a what a great honor it is to be with General Yadlin, who uh, and I once flew the same type of airplane. The difference is that he used to shoot people down, and I got shot down. So, <laughs> other than that, uh, and I also want to tell you that uh, I've watched a number of senators come to the United States Senate. This senator from New York has done a magnificent job in defense of the state of Israel and defense of freedom. And he's so kind. We recently had an encounter uh, with the president of Egypt over some of the remarks that he had previously made, and I can assure you he will not forget the senator from New York <laughs> from that encounter. I'm very proud of, of her. Uh, what's happening in Iran, obviously, the centrifuges are spinning. Uh, the latest effort uh, uh, at conciliation uh, and some kind of agreement with the Iranians have failed in uh, it's, it's very clear uh, that they are on the path to uh, having a nuclear weapon. And I don't think it's a question of whether, it's obviously a question of when. We have one of the most foremost experts, uh, uh, my dear and he, my hero, Ehud Barak, who is very well aware of uh, this issue. Um, look, the Iranians are, are watching what happened in Korea, North Korea. They just set off another nuclear device. We made concession after concession under both Bush and Obama administrations, and it turned into failure. So, Dan, I know we have a short amount of time. Uh, I think that this latest uh, offer on the part of the United States and our allies was doomed to failure. And if in Tehran, I think it is viewed as a weakness because of additional uh, concessions. Uh, but it is vitally important that in Tehran they understand that the United States, that there is no space between the United States and Israel, that there is no space between the two countries. And I'm going to give you a little straight talk. They believe right now in Tehran that there is space between the two countries. If there's one thing that I would hope that the president's reelection would would motivate him to work more closely with the Israeli government and take concerted action if that action is necessary, if it is necessary. Thank you, Dan. Senator Gillibrand, let me just pick up on where Senator McCain left off. It is true that there can be no daylight between the U.S. and Israel when dealing with Iran. 
But what about the rest of the world, the international community? You've seen this in some of the work you've dealt with helping Israel and the UN. What can the US Congress and the administration do to reduce this perception that Israel and America are at it alone? Well, as a member of Congress, we have uh, used that platform as a way to not only show our commitment to Israel, but, but make the statement that our fundamental securities are intertwined. Our national security is intertwined with Israel's. And so, for example, we have a resolution from last week that basically says we will stand by Israel, both economically and militarily, with regard to Iran. Um, when the UN makes statements, and it, it when, All right to clap. When, when, the, when the UN makes statements, can, particularly the Human Rights Council, we have to stand up to them. So whether it means uh, we are standing against Durban II or Durban III, we lead those letters out of the Senate. Whether it's decrying the Goldstone Report, whether it's standing up for Israel's right not only to prevent the flotilla from crossing, but to actually has a, has a duty to do so. Those statements have to be made immediately by American leaders, because I agree with Senator McCain, there should be no sunlight, and we have to continue to show that we are hand in hand as allies and as friends, as, as, and as fundamentally committed to not only Israel's security, but United States national security. Great. G General Yadlin, I mentioned that you were involved with two non-proliferation activities. One I cited because you cited it, your work as a pilot in the 81 OSIRAC operation. One you have not personally cited, but I can, according to international reports. You were head of military intelligence and involved with the Israeli operation dealing with the Syrian nuclear reactor in 2007. Based, based, based on those two experiences, and now what the West will be dealing with with a possible third non-proliferation operation. What can the U.S. and Israel do together? You've heard from Senators McCain and Gillibrand from the U.S. perspective. What about from the Israeli perspective? How do you see it day to day? <coughs> yeah, I think we all share the same data, the same intelligence. We are now on the same page in the foundation of the problem. We are also on the same page on the goal, the strategic goal, to prevent Iran from being nuclear. But between the floor and the ceiling of the problem, there are doors and windows that we are not in the same place. And we should be much closer on how to prevent Iran from being nuclear. Because 2012 passed with giving more time for negotiation, for sanctions, for reaching an agreement, for diplomacy. And the time is running out in 2013. There are triple T's that make us a little bit different on Iran when it's come to policy. It's different trauma, it's different trigger, and maybe not enough trust. So we have to develop that even though we come with different traumas, you know, we are the Israelis coming with the Holocaust. We are six million Israelis listening to Ahmadinejad, calling to the annihilation of Israel. We take it very seriously, very seriously. You came with another trauma. The name is Iraq. And you don't want, and justly so, to go to another war. But this is not a war. This is a one-night operation. And we should speak about it. Senator McCain, it's hard to consider what is going on vis-a-vis -vis Iran in, a, in isolation. The whole region is in turmoil. A, a, a recent Israeli diplomat, former Israeli diplomat, said to me that, that what Israel is doing right now, when there's talk about Israel, for instance, making territorial concessions in the context of a peace agreement, that Israel's being asked to pitch a, pitch a tent in the middle of a hurricane, that if you look at what's happening in Egypt, if you look at hap what's happening in Georgia, Jordan, recent parliamentary elections, 25% of the parliament elected, Islamists. You look at what's happening in Syria and Lebanon. You recently returned from Egypt. You spent some time with President Morsi. This has been the cornerstone of Israel, one of the cornerstones of Israeli security for three, 30 years, that relationship with Egypt. Based on your recent trip and what you see in the region and the turmoil, how does Israel consider the range of challenges it's facing? I have not seen the Middle East and the world in a more dangerous situation in my lifetime. During the Cold War, it was very dangerous, but it was very clear what the challenges were. 
We are seeing the Middle East in particular, but the world in the midst of change. I believe that Syria is a national and international shame that we have allowed Bashar Assad to massacre 70, 80,000 people, and we have not done anything about it. It's an unfair fight. The Russians and uh, Iranian re are sending weapons. The Iranian Re Revolutionary Guard are on the ground. 80,000 people at least have been massacred. Lebanon and Jordan are in great danger of being destabilized, and the United States watches. Humanitarian aid doesn't get it. It's very interesting to go to a refugee camp and meet the leaders of that refugee camp, and the woman says, Senator McCain, these young children you see through this camp, they will take revenge on those who refuse to help them. Jihadists are flowing into Syria in large numbers. They are the bravest fighters. The arms and equipment that you're talking, that you're hearing about, a lot of that is going to the wrong people from, uh, from Gulf states. It is a situation which destabilizes Lebanon, destabilizes Jordan, and eventually poses a threat to the very existence of the state of Israel. And it's time the United States established this no-fly zone, provided arms and equipment to those who are fighting for freedom, and it's time that Israel helped them in whatever way possible that we can. Uh, Senator Gillibrand, I, I mentioned Jordan as well. We need, Sorry. We need members of the national security team who are pro-Israel, not anti-Israel. Uh, Senator Gillibrand, I mentioned Jordan. You've spent some time looking at Jordan. If you go east, there is concern based on the electoral developments I cited and about the increasingly sense that the, the monarchy there is, is wobbly. Uh, how should we and Israel think about this important ally of the United States and one of two countries in the region that has a real peace agreement with Israel. Well, you're quite right. We, we need allies in the region, and Jordan is being destabilized for a number of reasons. Not only is the Muslim Brotherhood rising in political power, but as these fighters come across, you have the risk of uh, militancy within Jordan, and that is going to create challenges. You also have a Syrian refugee population of 400,000 now in Jordan, which is a huge financial strain on an already wavering economy. Jordan doesn't have a lot of natural resources. Most of their economy is driven by government and the U.S. and being able to uh, provide aid to Jordan, allow them to get resources from the IMF is essential. So our role with regard to Jordan, we have to continue to help steward them, help them uh, keep some measure of calm uh, and be able to help them transition through this difficult time. And I think our role with regard to helping Syrian refugees is significant. We're going to have to be a friend and an ally because it is being destabilized right now. I think as, as uh, Senator McCain said, the whole region is in, in fluid flux. It's very difficult. Egypt, when we visited with President Morsi, um, Senator McCain was very clear, as was the delegation, that they have to stop the flow of these weapons through the Sinai into Gaza. So last week's news that we are now going to stop the tunnels and begin to flood the tunnels is helpful. But we have to draw Morsi closer to us. That is why we have to engage him and why uh, Secretary Kerry's uh, trip over there saying we'll give you $250 million is a step in the right direction because they need IMF funding. They have to focus on their economy. And without a stable economy there, you will continue to see a slide towards regimes and leadership that are not going to be pro-U.S., not going to be pro-Israel. Uh, General Yadlin, you look around the region, as Senators McCain and, and Gillibrand have cited, and, and from, take us inside Israeli decision-making. They obviously, the Israelis, it's our understanding, that view Iran, the possibility of getting a nuclear weapons capability, as the biggest concern. But you talk about all these other countries, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, you head further east, even Iraq, increased instability in Iraq, uh, now that U.S. forces are gone. So. Israeli policymakers and strategists look, look at the map, and how do they rank and prioritize which issue they got to deal with tomorrow? Yeah. <clears throat> when I was a fighter pilot, I used to have a couple of principles. One was never panic. Second, never be in euphoria. This is too dangerous. Be slightly paranoid, and that's what we are. Uh, by the way, uh, Senator McCain saved me from prison because we flew the same airplane, A4, very tiny cockpit. When you eject, you break your two legs. 
So I was in flight school. We knew already that the senator is in prison in Vietnam and it broke his two legs. And when I was heated over Egypt in 1973, he immediately came to my mind. And I say, I'm not going to eject. Maybe I will crash, but I cross the canal back to the safe side. Anyway, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. This, this is what we call, you know, the shared cooperation, shared intelligence sharing between America and Israel. APAC at its best. In this Middle East, which is unstable, very dangerous, the only ally of Israel that you can really count on, the only ally of the United States that you can really count on is Israel. It's, it's the only place that after you come and give some help and material and equipment, they really love you and not hate you. So Israel is another aircraft carrier over there. I'm quite concerned that another aircraft carrier went back from the, where it should be to make the military option credible, even though not, not preferable, but must be credible to make sure that the other options will work. And <laughs> Israel is there and every day on the ground, there is a cooperation between the two militaries, the two intelligence, there is ongoing dialogue, ongoing dialogue between the two defense establishments to see how we cope with the uh, same threat. Because non-proliferation in Iran is not only an Israeli issue. It's a U.S. national interest issue, vital national interest issue. And the, the, the terrorism that you see all over is an American national security issue. And the stability in the Middle East and uh, even though, you know, Senator Lieberman told me late, lately that the fact that Israel and the United States discovered natural gas and shell oil is, is, the, is the proof that there is Almighty and He is listening to our prayers. <laughs> however, however you, you cannot really pivot to the Pacific. The, the Middle East is very important. Maybe there is oil, but the price of oil is happening there. So it's a very important uh, area to both of us. And if we do it together, if we, if we cope together with the nuclearization of Iran, with the terrorism, with what will emerge in the Arab Spring, so-called Arab Spring, I think the two countries will be better off. Uh, we are, we are running out of time, and I want to move to just the closing part of this discussion. I want to ask, ask each of you, starting with uh, Senator Gillibrand, th this room of people, this amazing collection of American citizens, citizen activists, who are going to engage their representatives in Congress this week during the policy conference tomorrow and make the case for the U.S.-Israel relationship and why it is a centerpiece of America's security and stability and position in the world. What is your message to this group of, of dynamic and energetic activists as they go to make their case? How can they make it most effectively? Well, first, I want to say thank you. It makes such a difference that you come to Washington, that you talk to your legislators, talk to your Congress members and senators about what matters so much to you, because there is so much more work that has to be done. Um, even as Senator McCain and I are working hard on things like Iran sanctions, we find out that we have to engage the European central bankers to make sure they're not allowing money to flow still into Iran. These are issues that need advocacy every single day. So I just want to thank you for being so engaged and knowing how important your voice is to our democracy here in America. General Yadlin, you're normally at your a very important think tank, the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel. Uh, but as you travel the world and you spend time in places from Jerusalem and Tel Aviv to Washington, D.C., what do you think would be the most effective case from an Israeli perspective for American uh, congressional representatives to hear? I think this crowd deserve uh, a lot of credit for the, what they are doing. So they have to continue with the very good jobs that they are doing. I think the most important thing at that point is to fight the DBS, the wrong narrative about Israel. Because Israel is a just cause. Israel has the moral ground. 
Israel should be in the same values that we all believe in the past that Israel represents. And there is now a war. It is not a war with airplanes, not a war with tanks. It's a war with speeches, with the wrong narratives, with a lot of lies, and these people should fight it as we are doing it. We don't have... <laughs> Let's say we should create the structure to fight this war in the same structure that fight the kinetic war. But this war, war of wars is really important. So come to Israel, see what Israel is all about, meet the young generation. This is amazing generation. As chief of intelligence, I used to tell them, guys, I have a problem. I don't know what to do about it. Do you have an idea? And these people, 25 years old, 26 years old, young captains, they went for a month, they went to three months, they came back with the most innovative idea that one day there will be books about it. And come and see them, they love you, love them, and together we can do it. And lastly, final word goes to Senator John McCain. What is your message to this group? I often tell my Baptist friends that it's hard trying to do the Lord's work in the city of Satan. It gets harder. <laughs> it gets harder every single day. By the way, your ambassador does a great job. Uh, he, does. he really does. He does. Fine job here. Despite the fact that he became a socialist in the Ivy League. But other than that, he's... Uh, uh, I, I, <coughs> my, fr my friends, Honoran. The only way to dissuade the Iranians from the path they're on is for them to believe the United States and Israel will act together on Egypt. Yeah. Egypt is the heart and soul of the Arab world, and we must pay clear, careful attention, and we must gauge our aid to Egypt as to their progress. We cannot just give them a blank check, but we don't want to break the Camp David Accords uh, either. They're very, uh, a very serious issue. Everybody in this room had something to do besides be here this morning and this evening. And I want to thank you, because you're so serving a cause greater than your self-interest. You're serving the cause of democracy and freedom in a part of the world where it's a very scarce commodity. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, because we are in the most dangerous times as I began my comments. And your participation and your involvement and your engagement and your support and your commitment to peace has never been as important as it is today. Thank you and God bless. I want to thank Senators John McCain, Kirsten Gillibrand, General Amos Yadlin. Thank you all of you for participating.